Welcome, every, uh, all who have who are attending today. Um, my name is Lori Wasselchuk, and uh, you probably don't recognize me because I'm new. I am the Assistant Director of Public Programs, um, and I just passed my three-month anniversary um, here. Uh, it's been an incredible time, um, and I'm very, very excited to share this very first online program um, and conversation with Beans Velochi. Welcome. And Beans is coming in from Oregon. Uh, they're turning, tuning in from the Oregon coast. Yep. Oh, can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yes. Tuning in from Southern Oregon. Yeah. At least it's not too early for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. nine. It's, you know, a respectable time to be awake. <laughs> Um, uh, I want to acknowledge uh, that I am in conversation with you all from the ancestral lands of the Lenape Lenape people, whose presence and resilience in Pennsylvania continue to this day. I wanted to take this opportunity to honor the original caretakers of this land and recognize the histories of land theft, erasure, and oppression that have brought our institution and ourselves here. Before we get started um, in our conversation, I'm very excited about. I wanted to talk about some upcoming tours. Um, specifically, specifically, I wanted to highlight um, the remaining Pride Month events. Um, uh, next, uh, this Friday, um, Dennis Robinson and Ayla Shoher, um, Dennis is on this call. Hey, Dennis. They are going to be um, offering a special tour, Pride in Papa's Collection, this Friday, June 24th at 11 a.m. Um, join us. It's They're going to knit together works from Papa's collection to explore gender, sexuality, and LGBTQ perspectives and communities. So I hope you look, and it's, um, I hope you look onto our website for that, uh, that event. And um, next Thursday, a performance, a Papa performance called Gender in Motion. Um, queer Philly poets will discuss and read work in response to Women in Motion, 150 years of women's artistic networks at PAPA to close out Pride Month. Through performance and conversation, these poets will create, will talk about how uh, poets create supportive networks and how queer literary communities create space and opportunity. Um, so I invite you to come to visit our website um, and check out those events and please attend if you can and also um, the exhibitions um, that are currently uh, up in our museum. Women in Motion is up through July 24th. So if you haven't seen that show yet, please come in and um, check out that exhibition. I know there's one more tour in June, uh, I mean in July, um, if you wanted a guided tour. Um, and that will be um, led by uh, Anna Marley, the curator. So today I wanted to welcome you. Uh, I first wanted to introduce uh, Beans Velochi. Um, they are a historian of sex, science, and classification. They are a lecturer um, in the Department of History and Sociology of Science and Program in Gender, Sexuality, and Women's Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Their work uses queer, trans, and feminist methods to interrogate how classification systems become regarded as biological truths. Their first book, tentatively called Binary Logic is a prehistory of cisness that looks at how sex emerged as a privileged way of sorting bodies, not despite, but because of its incoherence. Their work has been published in Transgender Studies Quarterly, The Washington Post, and Avidly. Welcome, Beans. Thank you. Um, I, uh, as, I, as I've told you in our previous conversations, I'm um, really interested um, in the way you approach history. Um, and we've been talking a lot about Harriet Hosmer, who is um, one of the artists featured in Women in Motion um, exhibition. And I kind of was wondering if you could possibly sort of talk a little bit about how you study history and the production of knowledge and how language is used before we get started. So people can maybe have some some tools to um, to stay to tune in to the conversation. Sure. Yeah. Well, first, I want to say thank you, Lori, for inviting me. Like when I first got the invitation to be part of this conversation, I and as I told you, I was initially like, what do I know about art? Um, you know, do I really have anything to contribute here other than 
enthusiasm, but the more that we talked and the more that I learned about um, Harriet Hosmer's life and career, the more that I realized that the history of art actually really does overlap with what I work on, um, which is the history of science and the history of queerness. Uh, so I wanted to just kind of start by giving us a little bit of framing um, for this conversation by way of an overview of like what kinds of questions and themes um, I have been thinking about in my work. So as Laurie mentioned, um, I am currently writing a book, which is very tentatively titled Binary Logic, The Power of Incoherence in American Sex Science, um, which is solicited by Duke University Press and will be out in like five years. So I guess stay tuned in a long range kind of sense. Um, but the, the book looks at how researchers in the late 19th and early 20th century United States basically agreed to disagree about what the categories male and female contained um, and, and often disagreed about if those were even useful or accurate categories at all. So essentially they kept finding exceptions to those categories, whether um, that was in the form of a certain species of animal like the hyena or the honeybee um, that didn't quite map onto the kinds of binary sex categories that they were expecting to find. Um, or sometimes that might refer to women who had all kinds of gynecological issues that meant that they didn't actually fit the physical profile of what a woman was supposed to be and what a woman's body was supposed to look like. And so the argument that I make in the book is that scientists actually had to do a lot of work um, of pulling those exceptional bodies back into male and female categories. Um, so these sex categories that are supposed to be natural um, and, and kind of all encompassing actually contain all of these inconsistencies that researchers and scientists kind of shoved back into them and then like plastered over. The point of all of this um, is that I wanted to think about the question of why it is that in the present, we tend to think about trans people as like containing the biggest kind of gender deviance that there can possibly be. Everyone else um, who we often talk about as cis or cisgender, um, which for those of you who might not be familiar with the term basically just means not trans. Um, everyone who, who is in that category of cisgender supposedly just kind of happens to fit into the category that they were assigned at birth. And I'm interested in all of the ways that that's kind of a fiction, that there's a history to how it is that we think of most people just happening to be male or female, and that history involves a lot of effort to make it look that way. Um, so I'm grateful for this opportunity to kind of think about this question outside of the realm of science, and instead consider how we might think of an artist like Harriet Hosmer, who is constantly challenging and defying gender norms as someone who illuminates this question of who gets reclaimed as a woman and who gets ejected from the category entirely. Because there were all of these women around the turn of the 20th century who were very precariously balanced on this kind of knife edge of womanhood. And they don't really fall over the edge. They're not people we would identify as trans now. They're probably not people who would themselves identify as trans if they were living now. But they nonetheless tell us something about the way that these categories of maleness and femaleness, manhood and womanhood are really flexible, even as they have these really strict limits that we know about, about who is supposed to do what. And so that's how I'm thinking about um, Harriet Hosmer's life and work as a kind of exemplary um, of this idea that these categories are, are kind of more complicated than they at first seem. Um, and so that's kind of my overview and I will turn it back over to Lori who will tell us about Harriet Hosmer herself and then I'll chime back in um, with questions and thoughts throughout. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh... I wanted to, let me just see. Okay, so <laughs> there we go. All right, I'm, I'm a, a, a Mac user that's really, really being baptized into PCs right now. Um, uh, 
But I wanted to open it up to everybody in the audience um, that's listening um, to, you know, I wanted to invite you to either um, add questions in the chat or, or um, put your, raise your hand and we'll keep an eye out for you um, uh, uh, to, to sort of intercede so this can be, you know, conversational. So you're welcome to, this is, Beans and I are going to be in conversation, so everybody else is welcome to join us um, one at a time, though. Uh, um, so Harriet Goodhue Hosmer um, was born in 1830 in Watertown, Massachusetts to Hiram Hosmer and Sarah Grant. This is a little bit of a background. They had four children. Um, Sarah uh, Helen was born in 1928. Harriet was born in 1830. Hiram was born in 1932. Hiram died within, uh, before he was two months old. So he died quite early. And then the, the, the second son, George in 1833, who also died a year before he turned two. Um, so there was a lot of loss um, early on in their family. Um, and then uh, Harriet's mom, Sarah, died of consumption at age 33 in 1936. So in the, in the, um, in the next few years, Harry and Helen and, and their father Hiram were, were the survivors um, of a lot of respiratory disease. Um, and Harriet and Helen grew very close. And then unfortunately, uh, Helen died in 1842 at age 13. Um, so Harriet had experienced incredible loss and, and after Helen died, Harriet never mentioned her sister's name again. Um, so loss and loneliness really marked her childhood. Hiram did what he could to make Harriet happy. He was a daredevil, to, Harriet was a daredevil and she was wild and the other kids were quite intimidated by her furious fearlessness. Um, she played in the Charles River, which was very close to their home. She collected specimism. She had her own little small ivory handgun with a silver tip, and she shot birds in case because she wanted to get better ideas of what they looked like. So she was definitely a specimen collector. Um, and she was also incredibly, uh, she was a fearless rider, um, a, a tree climber, and she was also really competitive. Um, and she was, although she was really well liked by people because she had a bright personality and she was very fun to be around, the adults really saw her as peculiar. And uh, a lot of uh, Dr. Hosmer, um, Harriet's dad was a doctor, a lot of Dr. Hosmer's friends felt sorry for him. They lived in a community of Quakers and, and Unitarians, and abolition was one of the pr most pressing issues. But uh, the Hosmers did not really take a strong stand on that. Um, so uh, Harriet was in and out of schools. Um, she often got sent home for being incorrigible and incorrigible beans, as you know, is one of the words given to girls um, or, uh, who they didn't know what to do with, right? And they didn't understand. I don't know if you wanna talk a little bit about that. Yes, so that was a term that actually, and this maybe is a way for us to talk a little about a little bit about some of the class dynamics at play here. Also, um, incorrigible was often a, a term that would be used um, for like young young women, let's say, like like teenage girls um, who, if they were poor or working class or black, often that would be a term that they would be labeled with, kind of as an excuse to send them to a reformatory um, to um, you know, boarding schools in a kind of involuntary sense, um, which it seems like for someone like Harriet Hosmer, who had, you know, whiteness and some class privilege on her side, um, that was, you know, probably a term that meant that she was kind of weird, um, you know, didn't do what she was supposed to do, um, wasn't living up to kind of certain standards of femininity. But, um, you know, she was not sent to a reformatory because she couldn't be controlled by her parents. And so that's also one of, I think, one of the dynamics to kind of keep in mind here also is that some of the way that she was able to kind of like eke out this, this space of um, not adhering to gender roles in the way that she was supposed to was um, in part enabled by the fact that she had race and class privilege on her side. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, uh, 
Dr. Hosmer's, you know, friends and neighbors definitely, they felt sorry for him. And they also felt like he couldn't control her. And I mean, and she was 13. Um, she did, a, she made some really serious kind of pranks. There was one, one, she had, she just was kind of a wild child. And, um, and uh, without going into too many of the tales, there was one point where she secretly unhinged um, two train cars. So the passenger car would be left behind when the train engine left the station. Um, and luckily nobody was hurt, but you know, this is just one of the, uh, the, the really intense things she did. Eventually her father did send her away, but not to a reform school. Um, he sent her to Mrs. Sedgwick's school uh, for young ladies. Um, and uh, there was a quote that he, he used, he, he sent her away for the greater tranquility of the town. That's how much grief he was getting for Harriet's um, reputation. But this turned out to be the best possible place that Harry could, Harriet could have ever been sent to. The years at Lenox, which is the town where the school was, um, shaped Hetty's character more than any other single influence. It was a space where she became loved, supported and encouraged to be herself. Elizabeth Sedgwick was a world, uh, uh, was a, a, a wonderful teacher, but also loved um, the, the girls in her care. Um, and Miss Sedgwick says that she wanted to create a world of female intimacy and, and a space where closeness was not taboo. Um, so there were about eight, uh, eight to 12 pupils living there at any one time. They each had their own, um, they had adjoining cottages. Um, the girls studied rhetoric, biology, ethics, philosophy, history. They were required to memorize and recite Shakespeare. They spent a ton of time outdoors. And then famous people like um, uh, Fanny Kemble and um, writers like Nathaniel Hawthorne, they would all come by and read with the, with the girls at the school. So it was a, a super, uh, open and caring and loving space. Um, so Hattie had, was able to be introduced to many independent, self-determined strong women while she was there. Um, and, and they encouraged her explorations. And by the time she left Lennox, about four years later, she knew that she would be a sculptor. But, and she also knew that she didn't want to be a sculptor as a hobbyist or somebody who was going to make cameos or anything. She wanted to be um, an, a sculptor as by profession. Let me go to the next slide. So um, uh, she returned back to Watertown. Um, and she did, she did what she could. She went to Boston to study um, some of the sculptures there and she, she sketched and her dad built her a little studio in the back and she started to play with things, but they both agreed that she needed anatomy lessons. Um, and Dr. Uh, Hosmer, um, he asked the Boston Medical Society if his daughter could study anatomy there, but they refused. And so they hatched a plan to send Hattie to uh, St. Louis, Missouri, where she would meet Cornelia Crow, her best friend from the Sedgwick School, um, to, to visit the family in St. Louis, but also to see if Cornelia's father, a very influential politician and businessman in St. Louis, if he could actually get her into the Missouri Medical College to allow her to study anatomy. Um, their plan worked. She was enrolled. She matriculated um, uh, in 1850. Um, she got her uh, anatomy um, certificate. Um, and, uh, uh, and it was the first time that ha Harriet was able to sort of circumvent all of the, the um, blocks and, and obstacles in her way to achieving her career goals. I don't know, you talk a little bit about anatomy. These are, these are some of Harriet's sketches, um, uh, her anatomical drawings um, of the muscle system. And I, I mean, I find them in incredibly beautiful. Um, and the quality of the, of, the, of the reproductions doesn't quite help you grab onto the beautiful penmanship, but you thought a lot about, and you, you've studied how anatomy has been gendered and, uh, 
exclusive. Um, yes. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, what's really, I think, interesting about Harriet Hosmer's kind of entry into anatomy is that this really, I mean, broke with a kind of longstanding tradition of excluding women from anatomical knowledge and the production of anatomical knowledge. So there's actually this really a foundational um, article, one, one of the, I think, like first really um, kind of influential articles in, in like the history of like feminist history of science from the 1980s um, that talks about exactly this and the way that the w women were for centuries excluded um, from studying anatomy and for writing the, you know, drawing the text, uh, drawing the images, writing the texts that people use to study anatomy. And one of the impacts that that had um, was as kind of people in the 18th and early 19th century were turning to um, scientific knowledge to try to make kind of social claims. So as there were debates about, you know, should women have the right to vote, for example, um, they would kind of turn to anatomy to say, you know, here are the physical reasons why women shouldn't have the right to vote. Um, but because women had been excluded from anatomy, there had been kind of no check on like the ways that mostly male anatomists were representing bodies in particular ways. And so that kind of manifested in, um, you know, as people were drawing skeletons, for example. And so there, there were actually no representations of what they, what people called a female skeleton up until the 18th century. Um, when that started happening, a lot of these male anatomists who were, you know, invested in um, women not developing too much social or political power would represent skeletons that they designated as female as smaller, as more childlike, as closer to what they would term primitive. A lot of them were, you know, also deeply racist in this moment. Um, and they would kind of use that to argue that, you know, women were just naturally fundamentally different, um, even on the, at the level of their skeletons and therefore shouldn't have social power because they were actually just like children. Um, and so it's really interesting to me. I mean, I, I think by the time that um, Hosmer was, you know, getting this anatomical education, I think there, there had been some movement of women into anatomy, but it was still incredibly, incredibly rare um, for women to kind of have access to that knowledge space. Um, and so it's not surprising to me that, that it was actually this like very difficult journey for her and that she needed this kind of like way in, um, you know, through her connections to Crow in order to get access um, to that, that medical education. And, and she traveled halfway across the, yes. country, the West. Right, right. It was considered the West at that point. Yes. So, um, uh, you know, one of the things that she did after she finished her studies is Cornelia and her decided to take a trip down um, the Mississippi to New Orleans. Um, on a steamship, but uh, the boat got stranded at a sandbar about um, two days in, and um, we're stuck there for, you know, they were stuck there for days and days. Um, Cornelia didn't like it at all. She headed back to St. Louis, but Harriet continued on the journey and just figured out, you know, that she took the journey and made all, took all the risks and went all the way, all the way down on her own and had tons of adventures. Um, uh, including there was a there was a place in Illinois, Lansing in Illinois, I think, um, Iowa. Sorry, Lansing, Iowa, where um, some of the guys on the ship were giving her a hard time, and uh, they were stuck in front of this bluff um, on another sandbar, um, and they they said, I bet you, you know, they said that she didn't have the strength or the, or they were challenging her on her physical strength and, and on intellect. And they said, well, I bet you can't, um, we can beat you to the top of that bluff. And she took the bet. And of course she won. Um, and it's a famous story in Lansing, Iowa. And that, that bluff is now called Harriet Hosmer, Hosmer uh, Park. So it's become a Mount Hosmer. Um, and that's just one of the stories of her adventures. It, it just continued. But the, 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 the amazing thing about this was this trip down south, um, solo journey, was the introduction to a lifestyle of an emancipated woman, sort of that many of the, her circles did not approve of. But it showed her 
to herself that she didn't need a chaperone or a companion to to travel and to and to do the things that were ahead of her. Um, so it was very formative. Okay, I'm going to go back to the next. One. Oops, sorry, going back. Um, so she returned to Boston after her her adventures in the West and her degree. Um, uh, and she um, began uh, to work further and study modeling as best as she could. Um, and she also met uh, Charlotte Cushman, an American actress um, uh, who became very influential in her life as well. Um, Harriet met her at, um, at the theater. She was introduced to Charlotte's entourage. She was introduced to her, her partner, Matilda Hayes. And um, uh, Charlotte was uh, also um, a philanthropist and uh, an art collector. And she um, took Harriet under her wing. Um, and I think they said, you know, they sensed a, a kinship and Harriet kind of fell in love with uh, Charlotte as well. So, um, but it was Charlotte who was about to travel to Europe, um, who uh, schemed with Dr. Hosmer and Harriet about on. getting her to um, study in Italy, where she would be um, uh, working with the best sculptors in, in the world, really. Um, let's see. So the, the plan was Harriet would travel with uh, Charlotte, um, and she would be introduced to um, uh, hopefully a mentor, a tutor, and she would be able to work with real marble, study with real li live models, and with skilled craftsmen. Okay, but before she went, um, she wanted to create her very first original work, um, uh, so she would have something to show before she went to Italy. So inspired by Tennyson's poem in, Memoran in Memoriam, Hattie chose to create a bust of Hesper, the mythological maid of the evening star. She worked eight to 10 hours a day. The Hosmers hired a craftsman to chop off the large pieces of marble, but she wouldn't let them near after those big pieces of marble were removed so she could actually learn how to work the smaller, smaller marks and, and use the smaller tools. Um, she finished the piece and it received acclaim. People were very curious to know that Hesper was created by such a small, young, not even 20 years old woman by herself. Um, and Lydia Maria Child, who was that pro her proponent, neighbor, family friend, she also had a lot of pool and she wrote a letter to the New York Tribune um, talking about this amazing talent, Harriet Osmer. Um, so, and she wrote, the mechanical execution of the bust is worthy of its lovely and lifelike expression. The swell of cheek and breast is like pure, young, healthy flesh, and the muscles of the beautiful mouth are so delicately cut that it seems like a thing that breathes. So people heard about Harriet Hosmer, even, Hosmer, even before she got to Italy, they had heard about this young woman. Um, so Charlotte, Dr. Hosmer, Harriet, Matilda, and Charlotte's entourage um, all left for Italy. Um, and when they reached Rome, uh, the first thing of business was to go find a tutor for Harriet. Um, see. They hoped to convince John Gibson to accept her as a student, but weren't sure at all that he would take a pupil, um, much less a woman. Um, but when Gibson saw, oh, and Harriet traveled with two daguerreotypes of Hesper, as well as her certificate from the, um, for her anatomy studies. So when, when Gibson saw the daguerreotypes of Hesper, he immediately invited the Hosmers to his studio. And uh, they they decided they were going to work together. Um, and he said, I will teach you everything I know. He saw such a, a talent in Harriet. And so that began a, a lifelong relationship. Harriet studied, thought she might study with John Gibson for uh, two years. She was there for nine. Um, and they became very close. So 
Charlotte was a, a social woman. She was very popular. She had lots of friends and it was a woman's. She and Harriet lived with Charlotte. Dr. Hosmer went back after a month, leaving Harriet to, on her own there with, with Charlotte and the community there. Um, and uh, so she was brought into um, the, the Rome's ex expatriate community where she was welcomed. People were very curious about her. They also raised eyebrows um, when she rode around town on her horse. She can, Harriet continued to sort of live the, light, the life that she saw fit. She was very um, unconcerned about what other people thought of her. Um, but you know, people. She was walking and riding alone, which women did not do in Rome at that time, um, and they people complained um, to Charlotte, but also to authorities um, that that and they stopped her from riding around. Um, so Harriet then decided to ride around in the countryside. So she just took her horse out of the city and started riding around the countryside, exploring um, the the fields and the Campania. Um, so she had a lot of invitations to parties, um, but she totally disregarded the ideas of and conventions around dress and manners. Um, and th there were, uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about this, but I wanted to um, kind of talk about some of the language uh, right now, <laughs> um, Beans. Um, and does anybody have any, any, anybody have any thoughts? Let me just see, no, no questions yet. Um, I wanted to talk to you about the language because the word Amazon kept coming up as I was studying her. And, and that was such a, a surprise to me. Um, uh, Amazon was used pretty liberally for, towards women. And I just thought, I was wondering if you had any, come across that at all. Yeah, I've definitely encountered it as a kind of, um, you know, I, I think it's a word that kind of over the course of the like late 20th century got kind of like reclaimed as this kind of like feminist strong woman kind of um, term that was something to be celebrated. But at this moment, it definitely would have been more of like this. There is something going on with this woman. This is too much. She is like too forceful. Um, this almost kind of like mythical, like almost like I don't think it would be an overstatement to say like almost like beastly, you know, like th this kind of um person who is just too large too much um taking up too much space um what what is really interesting to me and I, I was thinking as I was just like reading this quote it was reminding me of um the way that people would would talk about like women with too much education women who were like too smart in the 19th century um and I think this this is kind of has something in common with like the way that you know, it seems like because of her talent, they had kind of, people had imagined that she would, you know, be bustling with weapons. Um, <laughs> there was this kind of weird thing that would happen. Um, and this was often like in reference to just like women who were just like very um, intellectually talented in one way or another in the late 19th century where people would kind of be like, well, if they're that smart, then they must have these masculine brains, which is a problem, but we want women to be smart. What do we do? And it's this kind of like weird catch 22 that people themselves into. Um, and this was a, a, like particularly um, salient for people as um, you know, more prestigious like women's colleges started to come into existence. Um, you know, th like places like, Smith, Wellesley, Mount Holyoke. I went to Smith as an undergrad, so I have a particular, yeah, fondness for um, for that kind of narrative. But it, it was, it's this really, I think, like interesting way that we can see that the kind of there's this tension um, between what a lot of commentators in the 19th century wanted women to be in the abstract. They wanted them to have talent. They wanted them um, to be educated, but only for only a little bit, only for the sake of being a good wife and a good mother. And so when women started to exceed that um, and to have a lot of success, it became this kind of like, oh no, they're too, we can only credit that kind of success to this like inherent manliness um, because we can't imagine that women might just be really good at sculpture or at, you know, writing literature or at science or whatever the case may be. You know, and I found reading about Harriet, she 
had the same kind of like complicated space you know she was like she was always toying with the idea of marriage and you know and she and she you know she referred to a lot of her well all of her lovers and loves of her life as her husband and or as her as her wife actually she was she had wives so they, they were she didn't call them her husbands she had the wives um so but she was she always, whenever one of her friends got married from the Sedgwick school, um, she was always like, you know, this is, this is, this looks really secure. There's some positive things here. And she was also very ambiguous. Um, and she also had some pretty conservative views towards womanhood as well. It's very interesting, but they obviously did not apply to herself. You know, I mean, she really didn't, it was, um, it was definitely, a. a you know, there was some some split thinking there. But also, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how, um, you know, people had heard about Harriet Hosmer, continued to hear about Harriet Hosmer um, as time went on. And um, uh, a lot of British and American intellectuals came and were drawn to Rome. Touring artist studios was one of the attractions. And Harriet was Harriet's studio with John Gibson was definitely one of the most popular ones. Nathaniel Hawthorne came to visit her in her studio, and I just wanted to read what he wrote about his visit with ha um, ha Harriet. She had on a male shirt, collar, and cravat with a brooch of estrusion gold, and on her curly head was a picturesque little cap of black velvet, and her face was a bright and funny and as small of feature as a child's. It looked in one respect youthful, and yet there was something worn in it too, as if it ha had faced a good deal of wind and weather, either morally or physically. There was never anything so jaunty as her movement and action. She was indeed very queer, but she seemed to be her actual self and nothing affected, not ma nor made up. So that for my part, I give her full leave to wear what may suit her best and to behave as her inner woman prompts. I thought that was really nice. Yeah, that's, I mean, that reminds me of a lot of, there, so there's like increasing um, literature from historians uh, in the past couple of years recently um, about kind of all, all kinds of, of queer and trans people living in the 19th century, often in um, kind of rural spaces, but not always. But one of the things that is like kind of striking about them is often there's this kind of um, conclusion that historians have come to that, people could, you could kind of get away with a lot if you were a respected member of your community. Um, and so if you had family ties and social ties, um, you know, you might be the weird uncle or, you know, the mannish aunt or whatever. But if you were kind of attached to a family, if you were seen as doing a valuable job for your community, um, there's this kind of funny way where, you know, of course, it was still really difficult to be a queer person in the past. In a lot of ways, it's still really difficult to be a queer or trans person now, increasingly so, again. Um, but there's, also, and this, this seems to be something that tracks here also, where, um, you know, there's this kind of simultaneous, like, on one hand, people think she's weird. On the other, because she is so enmeshed in this kind of like social world. Um, there's a way where, I mean, people clearly do respect her talent um, at the same time that they're kind of treating her as this like exotic creature that's kind of strange. Yeah, yeah. Another shot of her on her horse. Um, so Fanny Kemble was, um, was one of the one of the people she knew from the Sedgwick School, um, you know. Again, supporting her, but also scared for her, right? You know, and um, I feel like Fanny Kemble's kind of um, sort of speaking about that. I think a lot of people that loved Hattie, you know, knew. You know, they they kind of. I mean, this biography that I read didn't really talk about. You know, they never tried to stop her. They always encouraged her, but they were scared for her. All right, so now we're gonna to get to some of the first works made in Italy. Um, after a year of copying, Gibson had her um, work very hard um, copying the classics, right? But after a year, he, Gibson said it was time to make her, uh, her first original work. Um, 
Harriet and Wayman Crow, remember the patron who got her into the school, the Missouri Medical School, she continues to be very close with that family. Um, in fact, they she considers considers it her family and vice versa. But uh, Wayman was also um, always behind her and said he would support her throughout her career. Um, so she sent back the good news to Wayman about how her, her um, mentor has said she can start to create her own work and she progressed so fast. Um, and he sent Harriet 300 pounds to commission her first full length work. So this was unprecedented. Gib the, uh, John Gibson was like, what? You know, you got, the, you got a commission for a work, your very first work and all the other sculptors in, the, in Rome were like, wow, congrats. Um, and so, you know, Wayman is huge in, in Harriet's ascendant, ascendancy and support. Um, she couldn't have done this, any of this without, without his backing. Um, so uh, she chose Daphne um, for, as her first work, a nymph who shunned marriage and vowed perpetual virginity, fleeing the god. Daphne prayed for uh, and was fleeing the god Apollo, sorry. Daphne prayed for and was transformed into a laurel tree, laurel tree just as uh, Apollo was about to take her. Uh, rather than depicting the dramatic, dramatic moment of escape, which I think a lot of men would have been interested in, that sort of violent uh, moment of life, she modeled a serene image that symbolized, symbolized Daphne's metamorphosis by terminating the bust into laurel branches. Any thoughts about Daphne as her first choice? I mean, I'm I'm struck by like the I mean when you said the um, you know perpetual virginity like there there's a really interesting kind of way that I think a lot of um, women were able to in, in the 19th century and, and into the early 20th century able to kind of take advantage of the fact that like a lot of just kind of the public more broadly like didn't think that sex between women counted as sex um, and so you hear a lot of women who are um, involved and in, there were a lot of a lot of women involved in like social work these kind of like moral professions um but I would imagine that I, I think this like went for for some art circles as well um where you know you would kind of get like women who were had these extended relationships with each other but they were seen as like friends um you know and we still get that sometimes when you know people will like um you know dig up uh, they're like this happens in archaeology all the time where right? they'll like dig up two people who are buried together and be like oh these two women were just clearly very good friends who wanted to be buried together it's like no clearly like they were in a romantic and presumably sexual relationship um but it's just hard to see in the past but anyway point being that um that that's really interesting to me that I wonder if there's a way that um that choice was this kind of um outward portrayal of like morality um that can was actually sometimes a really useful cover for um women who uh you know would have been seen as immoral in other circumstances 100 percent, and many i mean all of the women that that harriet hung around with and and loved and was loved by um they all they were publicly declared to be, they were gonna be celibate. You know, the celibacy was a word that they used a lot, um, which I think, you know, is right along the lines of what you just said, yeah. Um, but also I think, you know, uh, just rethinking about who these women, these mythological women were um, through, you know, she really brought uh, a female voice into these stories that were really told in paintings and sculptures um, by men. And so the next um, piece, actually, um, that uh, was Medusa. Um, and uh, she um, managed to create sort of, Medusa is um, uh, part of Greek mythology, but she, instead of showing a horrific Gorgon, right, she with snakes in her hair, um, Hosmer's compassionate rendering shows Medusa's transformation in progress, snakes intertwined with her lovely hair, and her bust is of a beautiful woman before metamorphosis has taken hope, hold. Um, she is dignified and resigned to her fate. So Hosmer really managed to comment on the condition of women and debate um, uh, through these two um, 
busts um, challenging popular representations of these mythological features and emphasizing their humanity. So both of these, um, as this work is being presented in public, they continue to, Harriet's name and reputation continue to become more well-known and much more appreciated. People are very excited about uh, Harriet's work in Rome and abroad. Um, the next piece uh, is another sculpture that's um, uh, commissioned. No, this was a gift for Wayman Crow because now to buy all the marble, to buy all the um, supplies, to um, uh, and and also the the assistance that that it takes to create a piece from ideation to the final product was very expensive. So throughout these years, Harriet was continuing to write to Wayman Crow asking for his support, and she was trying to be frugal, but. Um, you know, sculpture was expensive, right? So she created this this piece specifically to give to Wayman Crow as a gift. Um, and Anone depicts the nymph of Greek mythology. So there's more nymphs, um, who was the lover of Paris before he abandoned her to pursue Helen of Sparta in the Trojan War. Prior to these tragic events, Anone prophesied that Paris would be injured in Sparta and begged him not to go. When Paris refused to heed her warning, Oneni told him that she, he should return to her on Mount Ida if he was wounded, for only she could heal him. During the ensuing war, Paris was struck by an arrow and returned to Mount Ida seeking Oneni's aid. She refused to heal, heal him, however, because he had betrayed her for Helen. Not long after sending him away, she regretted her decision and rushed after the wounded Paris, but it was too late. He had already died. Overcome by grief, she flung herself into Paris's flaming funeral pyre. So Hosmer interpreting Anone shows her really thoughtful, not passionate, overwrought, but really thoughtful and, and um, sort of an idealized uh, features of classical models, betraying little emotion, yet the sculpture's mournful pathos is expressed through the sloping curves of the body. Anone appears lost in reflection, her index finger coming close but not touching the Sir shepherd's crook, a stand-in maybe for her absent lover. So this is all between 1854, 1855, a very, very productive time. Um, and this piece I think our audience is very familiar with because it's part of Pafa's collection. Um, so the next work, um, again, her sculpture is now being sent abroad and people um, in America are now able to see Anone in, in um, Boston and in uh, St. Louis where it resides now. Um, and her name is, is growing in stature. Um, the next piece Puck uh, is inspired by the Sprite in A Midsummer Night's Dream. Many say that Puck is practically a self portrait People called it a laugh in marble. Hosmer is appealing to the popularity in English in England and America. So Hosmer is now becoming a businesswoman because I think she's getting very self-conscious about asking Wayman Crow for more money. So she's thinking about um, marketing, right? And this was her most popular piece. Um, she made copies of this piece and earned her probably a total of over $30,000 on this one um, sculpture, but it was one of the most popular. Even the Prince of Wales on visiting her studio bought one of these sculptures for his, his room at Oxford, for his rooms at Oxford, because he was a young prince, Prince Edward. Um, so uh, uh, Papa has one, I think there's three remaining and um, we purchased this in the last uh, 10, 10 years, I believe. Um, uh, very proud to have it part of our collection. And this is a, um, um, a character, um, a cartoon sketching out um, the visit of Prince of Wales. And this was published in Harper's Weekly. And you can see um, uh, the draw. People are, are walking around and how she holds herself in, in, in that company. It really didn't matter to Harriet whether you were a prince or you were one of her um, uh, workmen, right? They were everybody, she treated everybody uh, equally. Hmm. 
So Beatrice Sensi, this is the first, this was created in 1856. This was the first um, time Harriet decided to work outside of Greek mythology and neoclassical subjects. Um, and this actually was another commission um, by another businessman in St. Louis. So St. Louis, that trip to St. Louis really helped uh, cement her career. Um, uh, but uh, Beatrice Sensi is a, is a complicated tale. Um, uh, she lived in the um, 1600s. Uh, she was a Roman noblewoman who murdered her father, the Count Francesco Cenci, I think would be the name. Maybe you need to tell me what that means. <laughs> um, but at, she murdered him after he raped and abused herself and her sister. And Beatrice was beheaded um, in public in 1599 for her crime. But she became an empathetic and tragic heroine and whose story endured. And at that time in um, the literary world and the um, visual arts world, they were telling the story about Beatrice Cinci, um, uh in, in all kinds of forms. And so she, this, this um, character in history became very much well known at that, at that time in, in, in the arts. Um, so the sculpture was shipped to Boston first and was put on display and received a lot of attention. Um, Rembrandt Peel, one of the, um, the sons, grandson maybe, son of the, one of the founders of PAFA, traveled to Boston twice to see it, that impressed with it. And he wrote, it is indeed a work most honorable to taste and talents and meets with universal applause as if it was the work of a great master. But when it is regarded as the bold production of mistress of the arts, the sentiment is greatly enhanced and felt by our ladies of taste. So there was a but in his <laughs> assessment of, <laughs> of this sculpture. Um, any thoughts? I mean, I guess not about this sculpture in particular. I, I was thinking more about the the image you showed of, of this kind of like crowd, um, you know, around the sculpture. And it just, I mean, I think that there's something really interesting to me about um, the, I'm trying to think of like how I want to frame this, like the, narrative of success here because I it, it, I mean has me thinking about just kind of my own um you know very quick catapulting up to like the top level of you know history of science right I, I am now at an Ivy League institution um doing this work as one of the, the first trans faculty um at the university and I mean I think this kind of goes back to, to several things that we've been talking about in terms of this kind of, you know, on one hand, great success, on the other people, you know, are a little bit judgmental, right? That's the butt that you were just talking about and, and the kind of assessment of, of this culture. And there's like, I think a really interesting complexity about, I think how we often talk about like successful queer people in the past where we tend to either have these really, tragic narratives um or you know maybe even not just successful queer people queer people in the past where we either have this really tragic narrative and this was like only a life of pain and loneliness and like it was impossible to live life as a queer person in the past or we have these like very triumphant um narratives you know about people uh breaking down barriers and like rising to fame and like when actually it's probably a combination of both and i think that like Harriet Hosmer's career and life is a really good example of, of how there are aspects of both that like clearly um, she had an incredibly successful career and like a rich social life and was was just like doing her thing in the mid 19th century um, in a way that we're often we often don't get to hear about and that's really exciting um, and also um, you know there is always that but in the mm you know, assessment of her work and, and the assessment of her as a person um, that I think is like, I'm, I'm really glad that, you, that, you know, you're telling the story in this way and that we're getting to have this conversation because I think it's a really, like, she's such a good example of the kind of like nuanced existence of queer people in the past. Mm -hmm. So we're really, I had no idea that a time was flying. Um, so we got a lot to go through, but I'm gonna try to see where I can go quickly. Um, 
so you know she was very social and um and was very popular uh she went to picnics and parties and dinners she hosted them she traveled america she traveled europe um she was hosted by uh wealthy aristocrats and european royalty um she spoke of many wives and loves all throughout this time um, I found this a very interesting um, thing because, you know, oftentimes when people first met Harriet, they didn't like her because she was very direct. She was very sort of like clear about what she wanted. And, she, and some people thought that was very rude. But I love this quote by Maria Mitchell, who's like, you know, you know, uh, she's in front with her weaknesses and she's conscious of her power. I mean, I think that's a, a really amazing thing. And, and if you stick it out, you'll be very glad you did. Yeah. Um, Okay, so Harriet was also very competitive, super competitive. And um, she beat out a bunch of guys for this commission to do the first public monument sculpture in St. Louis, um, which would be a statue of Thomas Hart Benton. Um, and uh, I'm gonna just read a little bit from her acceptance speech in 1968. So she made this piece this is um, in her studio. Um, this is the clay model that will be um, casted. But uh, it was it took her about four years to create. Um, and in 1968, at the inaugural speech, she wrote, she said, your kindness will now afford me opportunity of proving to what rank I am entitled as an artist, unsheltered by the broad wings of compassion for the sex, for this must be, as we understand a ter the term, a manly work. And hence, it merits alone must be be my defense against the attacks of those who stand ready to resist any encroachment upon their self-appropriated sphere. So that's intense words, right? On her acceptance speech. <laughs> so she was getting some flack and there was actually people that now were saying, she's not really doing this work. Somebody, J John Gibson or some of her workmen are doing this work. She wasn't the actual artist anymore. And, and so the rumors were flying um, when Zenobia in Chains was um, premiered uh, in um, London at the London International Exhibition in 1862. Um, so, you know, she got, she was given one of the best spots in this exhibition, right? But people were very lukewarm because they were circulating rumors about whether or not she was the real artist for this. And so um, people just couldn't believe that a woman could create this, even with, her entire, you know, last 10 years of work behind her. Um, the, some of the sculptors stood by her, but a lot of them were being very churlish about this whole thing. Um, more damaging, though, was a, a, a reference in the, in the, and published, a published reference in the art journal um, about these, uh, about these rumors. Um, it was said that Zenobia, said to be by Miss Hosmer, but really executed, executed by an Italian workman in Rome, um, that was actually published in the art journal. So until then, Harriet just ignored it all because what do you do when with all this nonsense, right? Um, she ignored it all, but when it was in print, that's when she got her lawyer and she um, and she sued uh, for libel, um, and she force them into an, a public apology, not just in that publication, but in two other British um, publications. And she also wrote um, an article about the process of making sculptures, which is published and continues to, uh, it, it evolved over the years. I'm going fast, hang on. Let's see. Um, it, but then Zenobia, she brought it to um, Boston. She brought it to the United States. And um, uh, it was a phenomenon when it arrived in Boston. It opened, um, no, in New York, sorry, we went to New York. And it opened at, um, at the Derby Galleries. Um, and it was open for the first three weeks, there were lines around the block to see this sculpture, to see this sculpture, right? By week three, 17,000 people had come through to visit it. Poets wrote poets, poems to it, right? Um, this is one of John Greenleaf Whittier's um, poems. Uh, it was talked about in all the press. It was a sensation, right? So Europe poo pooed it. Americans just embraced uh, Harriet. Um, and Whittier wrote, uh, 
that he was super glad that Harriet was a female sculptor and he became and he said that she became a model for the feminist movement. He wrote, I am gratified too that she has lent an additional argument to those of us who believe in the natural equity of the sexes and that in the highest art, as in Christian arcana, I don't know what that means, there is neither male nor female, which I think was a really interesting thing to, to uh, write. Let me keep going because I slate. Um, commissions of larger works was prompted uh, Harriet to move into a larger studio. She moved out of John Gibson's studio in, 19, in 1868, um, and her new, but her new studio was just a few houses down um, from Gibson's, and uh, she moved into she moved out of Cushman's apartment and into her own. Um, another piece um, in that era, uh, she started to call her statues, her children, because all of her friends were having babies and she was definitely creating babies, right? And so she definitely called them her sons or daughters. Um, and this was the first time she actually sculpted a male form, an adult male form, right? Um, and this is called the Sleeping Fawn. Um, and, it, and it was exhibited in the, at the Dublin, exhibit, uh, Dublin exhibition. It was bought the first day it was on exhibit. Um, and in, in her letters to her friends as she was making this sculpture, she had mixed feelings about marriage. She thought it would be a good idea, but was never fully convinced. So instead, she just referred to her sculptures as her own children. But mischief, androgyny, they continue to be themes in her work. Am I shouting? Because I'm going too fast. <laughs> Is it okay? <laughs> um, you know, so just to, to give an idea, uh, Charlotte Cushman's home was the center of Harriet's social life in Rome for almost a decade. And there were many different kinds of relationships and lots of women. Um, there was like, there was lots of lover exchanges and, you know, leaving one for another. And I just wanted to give you a sense of um, Sh Charlotte Cushman was a very loving woman. And she, um, she, she, she was kind of a mother. I mean, it was hard to tell in some of her language whether she was a mother or a lover, but for sure, Emma and Charlotte were um, partners and and that was after Charlotte and Matilda. Um, but Matilda and Hel Harriet were also together and Emma was crushing on Charlotte, but Emma eventually married um, a man named Ned. Uh, Ned, can't remember his last name. Anyway. Ultimately, though, um, uh, Louisa Baring, Lady Ashburton, was um, Harriet's true love of her life, um, and they stayed together for 25 years. She lived; they lived on and off together. It was a, you know, it was, uh, you know, as um, Harriet traveled, she moved in and out. But uh, Louis, Louisa um, supported her, and um, and actually, Harriet sacrificed quite a lot to be with with um, Lady Ashburton. Ashburton, forgive me. And my final slide um, is uh, in her later years, um, Harriet discontinued her work in sculpture. Um, you know, Wayman Crow had died. Um, it was just too expensive um, to run her studio. So she eventually gave up her studio in Rome, moved in, moved to London or England for, to be with Louisa. Um, and so she started to like, think about perpetual motion machines. I think a lot of people were thinking about those at that time. Um, and uh, so um, I wanna just read something about that Kate Culkin wrote, who is a biographer of Harriet Hosmer. The height of Harriet Hosmer's career was in the 50s and 60s before she turned 40. Her decline in popularity in later years came about for a variety of reasons, including changing tastes after the Civil War, changes in Rome after Italian unification, and the attention Has Hosmer devoted to the, her relationship with Louisa. But another reason was that Hosmer was turned much more of her creative energy to her attempts to create a perpetual motion machine using magnets. She was not alone in this endeavor. Many other people were attempting to do the same thing, but Hosmer spent decades on this project eventually proclaiming, I would rather have my fame rest upon the discovery of perpetual motion than upon my achievement in art. Some of her friends were less enthusiastic, um, but she was, that she was lured away from sculpture by the invention of her own mechanical kind. Um, so that is, I wanted to leave you with um, Cornelia Crow, who was her friend and confidant throughout her life, um, who stayed in America, raised her family, but the two, um, uh, 
were best of friends and she was actually the keeper of Harriet's letters and a lot of her archive. Okay, I'm going to stop sharing. I hope that wasn't like too much of a speed date <laughs> at the end. Um, it but, sounds like Harriet Hosmer would have loved a speed date. <laughs> so I think it's okay. Um, I know it's late. Let me see. Oh yeah, five minutes late. Whoops. Sorry, everybody. But um, I was wondering if anybody has any questions or thoughts or comments. Thank you, Beans. I feel like this conversation and having your expertise in this space was 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 wonderful. Um, and I have so many more. We could talk forever about this. Um, Diane. Hi, I wanted to ask what the best biography that you read. I was very excited. I'm at the North Carolina Museum of Art and we recently got Daphne. And so it's really like front and center in our reinstallation. And we're so, I, I can't believe to finally learn so much about her. You know, this is our first, this is my first real introduction to something beyond the superficial. So what was the best stuff that you read on her? I think Kate Culkins is the most recent, right? Um, I'm gonna just write her name, Culkin, uh, is the most recent. Okay, I'm gonna get my book. Um, this one is um, Dolly Sherwood. Can you see? Okay. You can see all my little things. I am by no means an expert on Harriet Hosmer. I am like, I am in the crash school of learning everything I can about this woman. Um, but, uh, you know, it's been- oh, but I, I learned so much and I did not mind the speed and I love the interaction and I love the focus. So you can now relax, take a deep breath, okay? It was great. It was a great presentation. And an hour, you know, uh, uh, somebody as interesting as Harriet Hosmer, I mean, come on. And someone is unknown. It's not as though- you know, everyone knows everything about it. Because I could have talked about William Whitmore's story, you know, and Edmonia Lewis and Rodin when he first, you know, gained fame and everyone said he was cheating, you know. So there was so much more we could have added to the conversation. So I thought you did brilliantly to keep it focused on Harriet. Thank you. Any other questions or thoughts? Um, well, I want to thank Beans Velochi for sharing this conversation today. I want to thank everybody here for joining us today. Um, again, we have Puck on view through July 24th. If you want to come and see this fabulous statue, um, along with an amazing exhibition called Women in Motion. Um, so I welcome you to come to PAFA to see our current exhibits. Um, please check out our upcoming programs. Um, uh, Beans, any, any information or any news or anything you'd like to share? Oh, I don't think I have more exciting news than that. I, I just really want to thank you for, for including me in this conversation. I also learned so much. I had never heard of Harriet Hosmer. Um, and I am really grateful to, you know, know who she was and, and her continued like influence and, and popularity in, in the um, exhibits that you have. So that was really exciting for me as well. It's super cool to know you too. Yes. And welcome to Philadelphia. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you for joining us. I hope to see you back next time.